And I'm going to start the evening by talking about really a public health problem, uh, one where you can get involved in our advocacy committee or with our education committee that Dr. Piazza runs, uh, risk stratification and atrial fibrillation and failure to anticoagulate high-risk patients who are susceptible to stroke. So the normal heart rhythm uh, is very well organized with normal electrical pathways, which on the electrocardiogram show up as these P waves indicating a normal sinus rhythm. But with atrial fibrillation, you can see everything becomes very chaotic and frayed electrically. And as a result, the all-important P wave disappears. That atrial contribution to cardiac output disappears. Uh, in fact, you lose about 20% of your cardiac output uh, from atrial fibrillation. So it's quite common to feel a little bit fatigued if suddenly uh, you go from 100% down to 80% of your cardiac output. And the definition is it's arrhythmia characterized by uncoordinated atrial activation with consequent deterioration of atrial mechanical function. Now, the reason strokes are associated with atrial fibrillation is a part of the atrium called the left atrial appendage is shown here, and it's kind of a silent part of the heart. If you look with a regular echocardiogram or ultrasound of the heart, you can't even image the left atrial appendage. You need to have a special echocardiogram done where you swallow the probe uh, because this part of the heart is right next to the esophagus, and you can get a beautiful image. And here's the culprit, this thrombus or blood clot in the left atrium, just waiting to be expelled out of the heart. For reasons we don't understand, uh, when the blood clot is dislodged from the heart, it doesn't head south that often. Usually it heads north to the brain, and usually it heads to the middle cerebral artery, uh, causing a devastating stroke. AF is the number one preventable cause of stroke, and this is an area where right now there are up to three million in the U.S. with atrial fibrillation. We project by year 2050, there'll be between 12 and 16 million uh, adults with atrial fibrillation. Why is this? Well, I think it's because we in cardiology are getting so good at treating patients with heart attacks that the survival rate is extremely high, uh, and it's not that common anymore. Uh, patients tend not to die of heart attacks. They live for years after and develop uh, another condition called congestive heart failure after the heart attack. Congestive heart failure is one of the lead reasons for atrial fibrillation. And then the other reason has to do with aging. I don't know how many of you own homes that are on the older side, but uh, if you do, you have to call in the electrician because the electrical circuitry starts to go awry. Uh, the wires stop working, and that kind of happens uh, with many of us as we get older, uh, and it's increasing age that helps explain the rise in incidence. We're fortunate that the life expectancy has really escalated to new levels in the United States. On the other hand, with a longer age span comes a much higher frequency of atrial fibrillation. You can see that for every age group, men, shown in gray, have more frequently stricken with atrial fibrillation than women. However, Ladies, uh, I'm afraid to tell you that even though you don't get AF as much as the men, uh, unfortunately, sadly, you're much like, more likely to get a stroke from atrial fibrillation than a man. So in a sense, 
atrial fibrillation and its, its relation to stroke is a women's health issue. In the Framingham Heart Study, uh, we see a number of things. First of all, by the time patients reach their 80s or 90s, close to 30% of all strokes can be explained by the presence of atrial fibrillation. So although overall it might be 15% of strokes due to atrial fibrillation, for patients in their 80s and 90s, the percent increases to 25%, 30%. And as I mentioned, these are disabling strokes. Here we see in the background, in the dark gray, uh, the disabling uh, scores for strokes uh, due to atrial fibrillation, much more often disabling than strokes not related to atrial fibrillation immediately at the time of the stroke and also three, six, and 12 months later. So. When I say disabling, what do I mean? These are the types of strokes where the victims often need lifelong assisted care in turning, bathing, feeding, and being bathroom because they're unable to do it for themselves. Uh, the CHADS risk score to predict the likelihood of a stroke was developed by a good friend of mine, Brian Gage. He's at the Washington, at Washington University in St. Louis. And this was really a big breakthrough. He came up with this six point score system. And for each point you got in the CHAD score, you were more likely to develop a stroke. Uh, one point each for congestive heart failure, hypertension, age of 75 or greater, diabetes, and two points if you had a previous stroke or transient ischemic attack. And the likelihood of a stroke varied anywhere from 1.9% per year to 18% per year, depending on how many points you got from CHADS. Well, more recently, from Europe, has come along the CHADS VAST score, which is more precise than Brian's CHAD scoring system. CHADS VAST adds three additional points, bringing the total to nine, and gives a much more precise estimate of the stroke risk. It's particularly useful in patients who scored zero in the CHAD scoring system. And many of these patients bump up to a score of, uh, of two, and in these patients, um, uh, more often now we recommend anticoagulation. There's also a index that's available to help us assess the risk of bleeding in patients uh, who have atrial fibrillation. It's called the HAS-BLED index. The 2012 guidelines from the European Society of Cardiology are really considered now worldwide the state of the art, and they're really uh, what we in North America are starting to adopt and use all the time. And I think the three most important take-home points from these new guidelines are listed here. First, assess stroke risk using CHADS2 VASC instead of CHADS. Second, recommend anticoagulation for stroke prevention with a CHADS VAS score of one or greater. Because there are now nine different points you can get, more patients with atrial fibrillation will be recommended to receive anticoagulation. And third, favor novel non-monitored anticoagulants such as apixaban, rivaroxaban, and dabigatran over warfarin. Those, I'd say, of the 29-page printed document are the three most important points. And what this means uh, is that in the old days, we uh, who are clinicians lived inside this inner circle uh, with a, where we used to even treat patients just with aspirin, which has pretty much fallen by the wayside. We don't think that aspirin is very effective at all in preventing stroke from atrial fibrillation. But now with the CHADS VAST scoring system, we have a much larger pie in population of patients who warrant anticoagulation. 
here you see one page that I took from the new guidelines. Uh, basically, you assess the risk of stroke using the CHADS VAST scoring system. If you score zero with CHADS VAST, you really don't need to be on any blood thinner at all. But it's kind of hard to be just a zero. So most patients are at one or two or greater. And the recommendation is oral anticoagulant therapy, uh, also to assess the bleeding risk. And they, uh, the guidelines like the has bled index. And uh, the solid lines indicate what the guidelines uh, view as the preferred anticoagulants. And they're NOAC, the novel oral anticoagulants. The second choice, or plan B option, have the broken lines, the vitamin K antagonists, and that means warfarin. Well, there are barriers to uptake of the new anticoagulants. And in truth, right now, uh, warfarin is still the predominant anticoagulant prescribed. Uh, I think four of the uh, major reasons are for, for slow uptake are lack of familiarity. There's a lot to learn here. It's pretty confusing. There's a wealth of information. Uh, there's lack of a specific reversal agent if bleeding does occur. Uh, although we use an INR for monitoring the warfarin, we don't have any blood tests to monitor uh, these novel oral anticoagulants because they're given in a fixed dose, so there's nothing to monitor. And then there is, because they are more expensive than warfarin, uh, frequently there's a need for prior approvals from pharmacies. So these are some of the reasons why the uptake um, has been a little slower than anticipated. Now, uh, the biggest public health problem is that we have a way to prevent devastating strokes. You know, once, once the devastating stroke has occurred, we can do great physical therapy and great speech therapy. But the strokes occurred, the horse is out of the barn. So, so from a public health point of view, from an advocacy point of view, it's to everyone's best interest to prevent the stroke from occurring in the first place. Well, let's look at how clinicians have, uh, have practiced. Uh, this is a survey done in Europe from a decade ago uh, before just using warfarin. And you would think that with an increasing CHAD score, uh, by the time you get a CHAD score of four, your risk of uh, stroke is about 8 or 9% per year, for heaven's sake, and only 60% or so of patients uh, with atrial fibrillation in this survey of more than 5,000 patients in Europe are being anticoagulated a decade ago. One would hope that over the past decade, uh, there's been a lot more education of clinicians and that the number uh, being anticoagulated has soared. Uh, and there's an ongoing registry that's a worldwide registry called Garfield. Uh, and its purpose is to evaluate management and outcomes of real life patients with newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation and other risk factors for stroke. It's a very ambitious registry. It's going to have more than 50,000 patients, and they'll be followed from 50 countries. Uh, for a minimum of two years. Well, let's look, and this, this, these are data that have just been collected and that were just presented in November of last year at the American Heart Association. Uh, patients with um, a CHADS VAST score ranging anywhere from z zero to six to nine uh, if you add up the patients on warfarin, which would basically be the ones in this off-red color and blue color, at all points, even those at the highest risk, it's no greater than 
So where have we gotten in a decade? We've had no forward progress. And I think, you know, those of us who are committed to NATF, to uh, well-being, to the concept of prevention in general, we need to do something about this. We need to educate ourselves and the public. We need to educate clinicians. We need to be out there advocating for change. Uh, I say this is an unacceptable situation to have 40% left vulnerable uh, to stroke at high risk. Now, let me show you also, it's not just a matter of, of uh, failing to anticoagulate, but the patients who do not get any anticoagulation uh, shown here in these gray bars, no vitamin K antagonist, that means no warfarin, there are a real consequences, adverse consequences to the decision to not anticoagulate. Again, these brand new data from the Garfield Registry show a higher rate of stroke in the patients who are not anticoagulated, who are at high risk. There are, there are fewer major bleeds if you're getting, uh, if you're not getting an anticoagulant, you're not going to bleed as much. But look at the death rate. It's uh, almost 70% uh, higher death rate if you're not getting an anticoagulant than if you're being anticoagulated in this vulnerable population. Uh, in addition, it's important if you're using warfarin to uh, make sure you use it properly and that the INR is kept within the therapeutic range. It's very difficult to keep the INR between 2.0 and 3.0. Uh, some of you I know can testify to that from your own personal experience, but uh, an out of control or a low INR rate also has consequences. Uh, shown here with a higher stroke rate, a higher major bleed rate, and uh, certainly compared to a well-controlled INR shown in blue, almost double the death rate. So again, uh, this is the crux of the matter. We've identified the problem. We know, we know how to treat it, and uh, let's do something about it. In conclusion, Chad's VASC risk stratification provides us with a precise estimate of AF patients susceptible to stroke. Guidelines mandate anticoagulation, especially using novel agents for AF patients at high risk of stroke. And 40% of high-risk atrial fibrillation patients were not receiving anticoagulation in the prior decade's Euro Heart Survey and in the ongoing Garfield Registry. Uh, the Chad's VASC scoring shows that more AF patients are at risk for stroke than we ever realized previously, and uh, the benefits of stroke prevention outweigh the risks, but we have to take care of this large 40% population uh, that remains untreated. Uh, I think NATF and those of you who come to symposia like this uh, are well poised uh, to understand and to be active uh, for the need for education, outreach, and advocacy to address this important safety issue. Thank you very much.